It's like Abdi. Welcome to um, the Wayward Festival and to Aberdeen, um, if only virtually. Um, but it's great to, to, to see folk here. Um, the, uh, the, this session is um, uh, an event by the STEM Poets, um, brought, to, brought to you by, by, by the Wayward Festival and by, with funding from Creative Scotland and the Aberde University of Aberdeen and, and support of the Scottish Writers' Centre. Um, what we're going to be doing um, is uh, some readings and then um, some chat, um, and then we're going to be supported in that by, by Leslie Creeder, who hopefully most people can see uh, signing on the, on the screen. If you, as uh, there's a closed captioning facility available, if you, if, um, and closed captioning is in fact happening as we speak. So if you would like to um, click the CC button at the bottom of your screen, um, then uh, Louise Pepper is um, womanfully um, typing, <laughs> typing away as I speak and doing a wonderful job of it. Um, and the and Helen Lynch just told me I forgot to mention Explorathon. Explorathon is the other partner in this event and has done um, a great job in terms of um, bringing science ideas and uh, concepts to, to a wider public. Um, and I certainly was um, running a workshop uh, with, for younger children on STEM poetry last uh, Saturday, which was a blast. Uh, today, basically, as I said, the format will be that we've got some, um, we'll do a number of readings to begin with, um, and then uh, there'll be a period probably of about half an hour in the middle um, where we can have a discussion about some of the issues around the practice and the pitfalls of writing STEM poetry and particularly writing poetry about climate change. Um, you're very, you know, we'd very well, much welcome your input to that discussion. So if you have any questions for the panelists, um, then please enter those into the, into the QA um, section and we'll try and address all of them or at least as many of them as possible within the time. If there's a wider uh, commentary you'd like to make, please put it in the chat. Um, I think we probably all have got quite a lot of experience of this by now, so that should be great. Okay, um, our readers, I'm joined today by Mandy Haggis, who's a lifelong environmentalist who's nowadays mostly based in, in Wonderland, also known as Ascent, um, up in the northwest of Scotland when she's not actually at sea, um, exploring the northern waters and following in the footsteps of um, Pythias the Miss Elliot. Um, she, her background originally was in philosophy and AI and areas like that. So a, a deep technological and ecological knowledge and a very successful poet, novelist and uh, educator now. Evelyn Pye, I think, was, was certainly one of the prime movers in setting up STEM poet, the STEM Poetry Group in Scotland um, and has a lot of years of experience working with um, US organisations like Bridge um, and the Royal Statistical Society in, in bringing a uh, sometimes quite rigorous mathematical and statistical view to, to, the, to poetry. Um, she's an educator, um, a psycholo psychologist and a mathematician and statistician, um, but uh, has equally um, done operational research and other um, activities in the international mining industry. So a good solid from both, a good solid grounding in um, the challenges of interpreting science, technology and engineering and maths um, into, the, into a poetic language, into a poetic form. And myself, uh, John Boland, um, has, I, I'm based in the northeast of Scotland. I, I've been a lifelong writer, but basically the way the, way the world was, I came up in, here in the early 80s for the oil. Um, and um, ha as well as being a writer and a poet, I had a parallel career for about 25 years in the oil and gas industry. Um, so I'm probably the more of the engineering end of this particular lineup. So um, to kind of lead off, um, we, I think the, the running order is going to be Mandy, Mandy reading and then Evelyn and then myself, and then we'll move into a chat session. So can I introduce the wonderful Mandy Haggis, who's going to read us a couple of poems um, that might or may or may not involve ice. <laughs> Hi, Mandy. Hello, I don't seem to be able to start my own video. Um, am I audible yet? 
Yeah, it says the host has not has stopped my video, so I need the host to allow my video. Okay, off we go. Right, here we are. Um, so yeah, thank you very much, John. Um, thank you all for coming to this event. Um, I've been a forest activist for many years, but I found it very difficult to um, write poetry about climate change, despite being really worried about it, until I finally, I came across this single fact which somehow broke it open for me and enabled me to start writing about this topic and that single fact is the title of this first poem I'll read and it is that the volume of one kilogram of CO2 is roughly the same as that of a coffin. Every hour the average Briton fills a coffin. My wood-burning stove fills 10 per day. My journey to work fills 25 coffins, 25 more coming back. This is starting to bring it home. To visit my sister, 82 coffins. My aged father needs company, but it's 104 coffins for us to go there. At least my addiction to fancy notebooks produces a mere six coffins per year. See how easily I become complacent. A mere six. I'm not vegan yet, but the 130 coffins from just one kilo of cheese is giving me pause. Especially if I put inside each coffin a salt flooded Bangladeshi woman, a sub Saharan child drought stricken, or a capsized. Inuit hunter, or filling six coffins, the four legs, head, and torso of a polar bear. So having started writing poetry about climate change, it seemed like everything I've written subsequently somehow has got that, that tone to it. So this is walking in the woods in, in January, just right on my doorstep. I came across ragwort. A ragwort flower in the woods stopped me in my tracks this morning. It's January. It shouldn't be here. But here it is, brand new yellow, buttery as a motherly smile in sunshine, chuckling on its doddery stem, undaunted, taking a chance in this mildness. A little bit crazed, baffled perhaps, aren't we all, by what's happening to the climate. As John alluded, um, I've done, I sail a lot. I'm um, very fascinated by um, the journey of Pythias and I've written three novels about the journey of Pythias, which included going up into the Arctic. And I've had a longstanding um, love affair with polar bears and have been lucky enough to journey to the Arctic. And most of the poems I'm gonna read today are really are, come from that source. It's the place where for me, climate change is most visible and, um, and heartbreaking. This is a poem from there called Little Orcs. Fluttering in groups, they giggle at us like girls in a playground until a stone falls from a crag, it's crack a teacher's hand clap. They dash to their scattered slates, stall just before they smack into the cliff face, park themselves ruffling among the pages of the big basalt book. Today's lesson is hard. We burn 12 tons of oil per day to come and see their pack ice lunch becoming scarce. I think the ice can teach us a lot. This is called ice teaching. It starts with a quote from J.A. Baker who wrote The Peregrine. Man might be more tolerable, less fractious and smug if he had more to fear. Staring out from between two cliffs, a blue glacier, scarred by its battle with air and water, has nowhere to go. Slow incremental motion moves a mountain, but the sea's tooth skin consumes below. The boundary between ice and sea is frazzled, 
then pancake, then flow. We need nature to be fiercer than us, to show us like naughty children what is enough, to growl at us, no. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Mandy. Great, lovely poems. Um, and now I'd like to introduce Evelyn Pye um, for a, a different take on the same terrible problem. Evelyn? I was waiting for the host to OK the video. Great. Welcome, everyone. I have found that writing about climate change was really challenging. In fact, in the beginning, I spent a lot of time reading the latest research on climate change communication. In fact, I wrote an, an essay on the effectiveness of climate change policy. And if you want more detail, that's available on the Glasgow Review of Books website. The main findings were that a poem should be clear, relevant and coherent and avoid obscure references and difficult language. They say the focus should be on past loss and the restoration of what has already been lost, near-term benefits and opportunities to avoid future losses rather than apocalyptic scenarios. The evidence suggests that relying on the evocation of fear, shame and guilt is a poor strategy. Even if it does have an initial effect, it wears off it's not effective in achieving long-term change. Research has also shown that being overly strident tends to increase the likelihood that the message will be discounted or ignored. If you want to look at some of this research, I suggest a Google search of uh, Suzanne Moser as a good starting point. I wrote Displaced after reading a series of alarming newspaper articles on the climate central predictions in the UK, which would be below sea level in 2050. Um, these don't include all the local information on flood defences. So I went on to look at flood maps produced by SEPA, the Scottish Environment Protection Agency, and those all showed coastal flooding around the Frath of Clyde, which just happens to be where I live. I also read a government report on the impacts of sea level rise and storm surges due to climate change in the Firth of Clyde. It mentioned something that they called managed realignment, which seems to mean removing defences and letting the land flood. I wrote this point to encourage more people to look at the flood maps for their areas and obtain a better understanding of what sea level rise might mean for them. Displaced. I came home to this curving wide to feel the ease of water passing by, watch ships slowly slip away, swathed in comfort, safe in my skin, bathed in the mutter of guttural words. But the climate has changed. The river swollen all winter, familiar smur replaced by torrents. Drains overflow and drench soil. The rockery is dressed in dark green velvet. When I bought this house, I never thought to ask its elevation. I didn't investigate topography or worry about thermal expansion in our oceans, ice sheets melting in Antarctica. Now, when I drag my reluctant eyes across the latest flood maps, my road is paint spattered, a dark blue stain spreading closer, ink spilled on glossy paper. No one knows how long I've got. In 20 years, the sea will rise another foot or maybe three. I could live that long, but not here. I can't stay here. Many people seem to intuitively adopt an attitude model 
assuming that each extra foot of sea level rise or each extra degree in temperature rise would have a similar order of change. That's not true. At a certain point, it's about destabilization, feedback loops, a point of no return, irreversible change. Tipping point. Towards us, flow melts in the Arctic Ocean, lessens the glassy reflection of sun, warms our waters all the more. Hysteresis, lost history of the ice age, frozen for eons. Sea level rises, permafrost thaws, releases methane, Gulf Stream weakens, shifts south. In Antarctica, the white continent, blood red algae bloom in snow. Glaciologists mon monitor fissure cracks. Calving events toss out icebergs. Feedback loops start chain reactions. Transgress invisible boundaries. We cross the Rubicon, a global cascade, and Earth's climate changes forever. Um, this last poem is Blackstone. That was a common phrase in the 16th century. If you said something was as likely as seeing a black swan, it meant impossible. After explorers discovered black swans in Australia and it became clear, unpredictable events. We really have to live with the uncertainty. Black swan. It's as though we believe disasters won't happen, as if we believe all swans are white because every swan we ever saw was white as if we think we comprehend the fickle migration of birds. Beyond our ken, a butterfly flaps chaotic wings, wind changes direction, and somewhere far away, a black swan lifts its heavy body upwards, soars, invisible in the night sky, except for its blood-red beak. A dark arrow, coming towards us, changing everything. Thank you. That's me finished for this set. Back later. Thanks, Evelyn. Um, yes, I, I do like Black Swan. Um, the, my own, I'm, I'm going to do two poems now um, from my own uh, forthcoming collection, which will be out in, in, in uh, October, called Pibroch. Um, and Pibroch um, arises from uh, environmental activism I was involved in back in 2019 with XR, um, or Extinction Rebellion, and a feeling of the tension between oil industry experience and the need to basically stop um, extractive activities, um, because it's extractive capitalism to a great extent, which I think is driving the climate emergency that we're now in the midst of. Um, so. Uh, at some level, I was interested in the way that science and technology and government reports obscure um, the urgency and the immediacy of the experience of climate change of extreme weather events, um, but also interested in, if you like, the very deep roots of um, many of these aspects in our lived history and our evolution even. So I'm going to read two poems, one called Sweetness and the other called Confidence, and then I'm looking forward to the chat we can have after. Sweetness. Digesting other life against its will, diversified after the early Cambrian. The violation probably started with the tentacles of basal jellyfish. Poison permeated. Points tore into flesh, antler picks prized ore, we learned to burn, 
And now the drill string grinds through sedimented time, releasing the heat of carboniferous afternoons into our combustible cocaine. We can't unlearn the comfort we derive from warmth or coolness. The thrill of speed, the ease of traction powering the plough. For we imagined it before in fairy fantasies and gardens for the righteous ease and magic carpets. Ignoring the starving at the gate, the zones of sacrifice, the material reality of climate and terrain, birth and death violence and justice. Like the tentacles of Cambrian jellyfish, imagine power entangles us, rendering life to stone once more. Yet still we call this sweetness. Part of my practice has been uh, essentially analyzing big technical reports. Um, and in a sense, using them as a, as a sort of found poem. Um, so this poem, Confidence, uh, is in part based on uh, the account of what happened during the Piper Alpha disaster in 1988, um, as, as documented in the Cullen Report, um, and is also based on uh, the recent IPCC um, report on climate change. Um, and it'll be interesting to discuss whether this is too strident, everyone, we'll see. Confidence. Public inquiry into the Piper Alpha disaster, chapter eight, section eight. In the event, the system was almost entirely inoperative and little command or control was exercised. Dad was wearing a survival suit. He must know. He does not have a radio. He does not ask to use the public address system. He leaves for his private bunker without giving further instructions. Dad takes no initiative in an attempt to save life. Perhaps not even his own. All Dad says is evidence, work control, module, alarm. Five minutes later, he comes running back in a state of panic. Surely by then he knew. After that, there was confusion, delirium, commotion, heckling. Dad slumps down, trying to calm everyone, saying, the whole world knows we're having problems. So he knew. He does not seem to come up with any answers. No one takes charge. At this point, Dad says, attribution, adaptation, mitigation pathways, governance systems, scenarios. The personnel... The boys and girls, the men and women, the mothers, fathers, brothers, sisters, sons and daughters wait in the mess. Some of them will decide they have to find a way out. Some will wait in hope of rescue. Some will leave because there's no point staying. Some have stayed because they have been told to wait. Some take the view that they have nothing to lose. Some simply don't know what else to do. But all Dad says is private finance, sustainable option, industrial sequestration, future equilibrium, ecosystem services, weather security, human investment indicator, billions, the fuck, the fuck, the fuck! There is no systematic attempt to lead us to a means of escape. A large number make no attempt to leave. The risks of death are considerable. Those who remain in expectation or obedience will succumb to the effects of smoke and gas. That's what happened last time. Dad will never mention funerals, melting, engulfing, guilt, drowning, nightmares, loss, compulsion, mates, distress, grief, starving, mum, shouting, rape. Addiction, exile, prison, rescue, youngest grandchild, remorse, loneliness, denial, incineration, pain. Thank you.
Uh, would you guys like to rejoin me and we can we can kick off a chat and please put any questions that you have um, into the Q&A and we'll um, try and get them responded to as much as possible. Hi there. Hello. Evelyn, do you want to take your mute off? <laughs> yeah, there we go. <laughs> we are here. Um, I, I love that. But try to but. aim poems at the general public um, and to make them very accessible. And I'm very aware that that's possibly not producing the best poem. Um, but I, when it comes to climate change poetry, I think my main aims are to engage and inform. And there is always a bit of a tension um, with that aim as opposed to writing the best poem. Ah. Um, well, I guess that is that question of what, what is your audience? I mean, if, you know, in a sense, I kind of make, can make an argument that says, you know, that climate change poetry in West Africa should be completely different from climate change poetry in the North, if you like, for the simple reason that the logical things to do are quite different in those different um, predicaments mm -hmm. and the frame of reference is quite different. So it is this thing about, about audience. Um, and what I, yeah, I guess what I was parodying to some extent in confidence was, you know, I, whether it's dad or whether it's Boris Johnson, uh, the language that's being used um, is just obfuscating, even though it's scientifically precise. Mm -hmm. um, you know, cash, cool, cool cash and what was the other one? <laughs> um, so, so you know, came up with three three C's last night at the UN conference, um, which was nice. It alliterates, but it doesn't constitute a plan. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there's. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I mean, what, what, sorry, everyone, carry on. I think it's great. I really enjoyed that poem, and um, I, you using your specialist knowledge, um, and, and that's your voice and your way of doing it. I guess I think that I have specialist knowledge in psychology and in motivation, which I had worked on, and also in the psychology of risk, the way people actually um, react to those kind of messages. And I'm choosing to go down that route. I mean, it's not a route that I do for all of my poetry, but I, I try to be very simple and local and personal when it comes to climate change. Because so much of it is on such a grand scale that people find it very hard to really take it in. Certainly that there's lots of people I speak to who say things like, well, you know, there they go again. I don't listen to this anymore. I, I just kind of stop. I've had people say to me, what's the point in any of us in this country bothering because what they're doing in India is so bad and, and it's so great that nothing we would do would uh, make much of a effect. And these attitudes are very common. Yes, but it's also a question surely about how we address particularly that misnomer that it's all India and China's fault, it's all our fault. Um, and it is, and, and you can't do it's that another poem, John. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's going to be my next poem about climate change, trying to address that. Because I did at the time not say very much, but afterwards I thought of all the things that I wish I'd said. Mm -hmm. Mandy, I mean, it's, uh, re relating to what Evelyn said about um, what, what has been lost, or what is being lost and what might be just restored slightly paraphrasing there. I mean, I think, mm. I mean, I know that you feel quite acutely um, that those northern landscapes and the polar bears, but equally you've been in a position to, in a sense, witness it more. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess it's quite a question about, um, for example, Little Walks, how, how that relates to that sense of immediacy um, mm -hmm. for people who haven't seen whales or orcs or polar bears, if you see what I mean. Yeah, sure. I think... Um... It was interesting to hear us all, I think, profess how difficult it is to write about this this topic. Um, and I, I'm acutely aware of the of the paradoxes and contradictions 
in yeah in in being a a rich somebody from a rich white you know western country um with access to things like yeah being able to go to the arctic to actually see polar bears before there aren't any of them left um um, but also just on a on a daily basis the the kinds of things that we can do because because the technology is available and our society is geared to encourage us to keep having a bigger um, carbon footprint than than is fair from a global perspective um, and and it can be really difficult also to know what what is the what is the right thing to do you know I mean it, it's um, and it can be difficult not just to know that but it's difficult emotionally to deal with it I think and I, so I think that's where a lot of, of my interest in, in writing about this field is to try to actually find ways of engaging emotionally and rationally at kind of at, at the same time and, and bringing those two things together. And I think that that's why, why poetry feels like a really powerful vehicle for doing that because it does enable us to kind of layer language um, with different kind of um, different resonances and engage with readers and audiences, both engaging their minds and their hearts and, you know, and, and, and all the other creaturely nature of them. But because I do think that there's a, I, I certainly carry, and I'm sure lots of us do carry it. When you get, when you do decide that you want to take it seriously, you're then faced with this massive iceberg of guilt about uh, about our society in general and our individual behaviour. And faced with, you know, I mean, the brute reality is that, you know, in our in immediate environment, where okay, there's there there is flooding, and I recognise that there are, and I love that poem that you um, you. I, acknowledge that if, if in that that um the, you know the, the fact that there are people who are going to be displaced and there are people who are directly impacted in their lives but most people to be quite frank in Britain won't be our winters might get a bit warmer and wetter and the ragworts are out too too long but otherwise we're not going to suffer like the people from um low-lying islands and the arctic and everywhere else um we have one question in the feed um, which is um, how does one make a living as a poet in a, in a STEM-focused society? Um, how does one make a living as a poet is, a, is, is in itself a profound question. Um, how are we all making a living? I guess you guys are teaching. Mostly um, I'm retired, so I don't do it anymore, but I made a living by lecturing at the university. And I guess I made a living as a, you know, in a STEM society whilst writing poetry. I, I, you know, I think it's, I don't know many poets who are making a living if they're not either teaching or keeping down a day job as well. I made my living as an activist for 20 years, um, researching and um, so using, using my, my scientific skills, I guess, that, that I learned doing my science PhD um, as more transferable research skills and but then writing I, I did a lot of writing of campaign letters and of visions and of funding applications and of and, and so on so using my writing skills in in the service of the things that I really believe in um, and um, I mean the big joke always used to be that that um, if you to write a funding proposal actually having poetry skills is very helpful because you know you can you can use words in a charming and persuasive manner um, in, in order to win funding. And then when you write the reports up at the end, then being a novelist and writing fiction becomes, becomes in handy as, at that point. So um, that's kind of a naughty way of putting it maybe, but, but that's what I've done. And the, increasingly I teach creative writing and literature um, to, to earn, earn a crust. I suppose there is that distinction between making a living as a poet and making a living as a writer. Um, yeah, and we all, I think, um, work across genres from technical mm. reports to, to activism to um to to novels to to poetry so there's like there is a sense of um how do you make a living in a stem focused society as a wordsmith and i think that's mm -hmm. a, you know that's a there's more there's more opportunities than in the haiku business um <laughs> yeah um i'm aware of time um uh, are there any other pressing questions because there's only been that one question in the in the q a that i've seen um that um, the wider audience would like to um, ask about or comment on. Um, 
in the next five or six minutes. There's a question asking what which poets continue to inspire. Um, and I think that's, um, personally speaking, I think that we've just a fantastic choice has just been made for the new Scottish Macca um, in Kathleen Jamie, I mean, who I find hugely, ins ins hugely inspiring as a writer. And I think it's it's brilliant that we have her. And, and I think it's really um, significant that her very first act as Macca has been to invite everybody to contribute one line to a collective poem about climate change, which will then be read at the COP. So this is an invitation to all of you to write your one line of poetry and send it to Kathleen Jamie. Um, you can send it to the Scottish Poetry Library um, and they'll pass it on to, to Kathleen. Um, and collectively we can write the Scottish national um, poem about climate change. So yeah, she's huge for me. I think, I mean, to some extent, um, and that is it clearly is a you know what is the emotion that the climate um, the climate catastrophe evokes in us? Is it grief? Is it uh, nostalgia? Um, sh sh probably shouldn't be romanticism. It for me it tends to be anger, um, and that possibly leaks through in some of the poetry. But equally, I think. Um, not inspiring me as climate poetry, but I think some of the war poets, particularly Sassoon, actually, um, uh, are a kind of go-to in the sense that the thing around Sassoon um, was that he was deeply implicated. You know, at some point in his diary, he says, you know, the thing that upsets me most is I'm really good at this um, war fighting and killing people thing, whilst at the same time being disgusted by it. And I think there's, there's stuff to be learned from poets who were act are actively involved um, either in the wrong or in resisting uh, the, the, the change um, rather than someone observing it from outside um, in tranquility or whatever Coleridge's line was. Um, right, uh, can, we'd probably like to, to, to finish with a set of, uh, another set of readings, um, slightly different theme, but um, a slightly different reading order. So Evelyn's going to read um, a couple more of her poems um, and then I'll chip in a couple more and Mandy um, hopefully will close the bill um, apart from the, the usual administrative and um, expressions of gratitude details. Um, so Evelyn, would you like to um, take us off into Butterfly World? <laughs> yes. Um... Um... The research into climate change communication suggests making it local and personal. In this next work, taking a slightly tongue-in-cheek attitude at the beginning, well, more resistant to the climate change message. Small tortoiseshell. I've lived with the knowledge of endangered species, feeling something close to indifference at the loss of Seolas, vaquitas, pangolin, Colombian spotted frogs, American pikas, Lebanese vipers. I feel more envy than sympathy when a man on the radio says he's distraught that warming seas are bleaching coral and his children won't see enough fish when they snorkel on the Seychelles. I'm blasé about the loss of the black rhino. It's grey after all, and only distinguished from the bog standard regular rhino by a pointed upper lip you'd never notice when it was goring out your innards. But when I read the tortoise shell is endangered, I fear for the fragility of its orange and black wings. Feel them sweep inside my childhood hands. Remember that moment of release. And I are searching for siskins and squirrels when she says, this is boring, Granny. Let's look for fairies and unicorns. And I wonder if her child will look for bees and butterflies. In the last 50 years, there's been a decline in butterflies in the UK and climate change is now playing a part in that. 
Um, in this poem, I've also tried to say that small changes are worth doing and can make a difference. The butterfly effect. In the flower power 60s, a flutter of butterflies flash black rimmed wings, tiny stained glass windows grabbing sunlight. A kaleidoscope of peacocks, adonis blues, red admirals, purple hair streaks, orange tips. This abundance is no trick of memory, airbrushing childhood summer. Recorded for half a century by volunteers who squatted in damp grass, counting absence on clipboards. Sensitive to changes in climate, in warmer winters, adults emerge from chrysalids too soon, cling on, unable to flap their frosted wings or suck nectar through straw wings, die rigid as sugar confections. We order a cup of caterpillars and three weeks later release five painted ladies. In chaos theory, one butterfly can flap its wings, turn a tornado in Texas. Who knows what five will achieve? Um, the next poem is a bit of fun, but it's also true. Um, real people are working on drones to pollinate crops. Um, this was part of a sequence that I called Technical Solutions. Robotic bees. They're seeking a technical solution to a declining insect population, trying to build a better bee in the smart industry field lab. Fleet would sweep across the countryside, pollinating food crops. Imagine the litter of spiky dead bee box. Nature spent a hundred million years perfecting bee design. It's self-replicating, biodegradable, carbon neutral, unbeatable. Um, I'd like to end the poem about the Golden Mall. It's a small burrowing mammal which lives in Southern Africa. Blindness. The Golden Mole no longer needs to see, so her eyelids fuse together. Skin thickens, fur grows across the narrow slit shuts out light. She swims in shallow sand, leaves grooves on the surface as though her movements were traced by the finger of God. She hears the wriggle of worms, the slow slither of snails, the wind rustle of spiny love grass, the creaking stress on its roots. A shark in the dunes, she listens for the tapping of termites, is perfectly adapted to locate underground nests in the desert. But the mercury is rising too fast for the slow sweep of natural selection. So many different kinds of blindness. In the chat, someone was talking about version and the way our minds work. We do have psychological biases that protect us from anxiety. Most of us don't wake up and think we're going to have a heart attack or get cancer today. These inherent biases can make us blind to the real risks inherent in climate change. I'll pass you back to John. Thank you. While John is muted, shall I take over and read? Do you mind? I'll jump in and he can hopefully solve that. And um, I'm going to read some poems again, picking up on what I think can 
can happen hopefully to overcome that risk aversion is I think love is really important um, we're part of nature and I think that we need to um, love the rest of nature and and I think that that as we do that I think that can can nature feeds back and gives us confidence to try to um, do whatever it is that, that we can do whatever little part that is just knowing that we're kind of facing into our reality as, as a part of nature. Um, this, I, I'll, read, I'll read three poems which are, for me, kind of expressions of I hope, hope and, and love. The first is a bowhead whale, which I really think is the most impressive animal that I have the privilege to encounter, um, which was again up in the Arctic. Bowhead whale. Two humps of peace on an ocean of ice. Head bump, a modest mountain, Behind it, a ridge, a flow as the head rises, a gentle puff of ex exhaled air, a murmuring blow. Among the congregation, we might as well have said amen to the emergence of a deity. Cameras and glasses of devotion rise in reverence, fall in supplication. You make no popish gesture, Merely nod your huge head, return to the deep. Big behemoth, fellow traveller on the whale road, we greet you. How many years have you swum at your monk-like pace among this ice? You could teach us things we'll never learn, as long as we keep scurrying on, burning, burning. And this next one is called Yan Mayan, which is an island out in the middle of nowhere up in the Arctic Ocean. Um, and um, yeah, I'll, I'll just read it. Yan Mayan. Don't worry, when at last our voices and engines have gone, fulmers will mend the gash we made. Their beaks will sew the sea back together with a million copepod stitches. And then there will only be the waves, endlessly asking the same question, stones and black sands, giving a different answer every time. For me, it's really, really important to remember that we are not the um, center of the universe. We are not the only species the planet as a whole uh, will will recover no matter what we do to it i still feel desperately sad about the old, the other species we might take down if we carry on the way we're going but i do also have hope that we can turn the situation around and i think that a crucial thing that has to happen is restoration of rich um, ecosystems and encouragement of areas of land within our country to do their own thing and diversify and rewild, if you like, if you like that expression. Um, this is a poem I wrote when I, I'd been poet in residence at the Edinburgh Botanical Gardens, which is a magnificent place. But when I got back home to the woods, to the wildwoods, um, I really felt back home. And that's what this poem is called. This is how McKay must have felt returning to Ascent in summer, soothed and thrilled by the birches dance and the aspens hushing and clapping, egging us on and calming us down in equal measure. An exuberant jostle of lushness, awash with flowers, untamed bushiness, thronging without orchestration. What grows is so much more gorgeous than what is growing. Woods so much lovelier than garden. The assemblage so much more alive. Leaves in rampant proportion to the profusion of flowers. Life revelling. Moths, earwigs, spiders and birds dancing about in all dimensions. Fighting, fornicating, feeding. There is no watering. The sky does that. No one prepares the ground. It prepares itself 
or is joyfully unprepared for the surprises thrown at it. Nothing is sown or planted. Seeds set themselves or let the wind and animals take them, sometimes contriving their own personal supply of fertilizer. Otherwise, there is no fertilizer. It is all already fertile. Thanks. Thanks very much for coming and for listening. Hopefully John has got some technology to enable him to take over and wrap it up. Um, if if Kirsty could, yep. Yes, I have recovered technology. Um, thank you, Mandy, um, and thank you for stepping in. <laughs> um, my technology failed me. Um, I think uh, yes. Um, reinforcing to some extent um, Mandy's point, um, the planet will recover, um, and. Uh, the, there's a sense that um, we, we, we do take ourselves far too seriously in all of this. Um, I'm going to read one last poem and then we'll, then we'll move on. I, I just, it might be a downer to end on, but I don't think it is. Um, it's about that sense of proportion and about that sense of fatalism. It's called Worst Case Scenario. Worst Case Scenario. The brief but brilliant atmospheric transit of the asteroid will not, not be seen. Nothing will hurt or disappoint. The shock wave when the magma chamber bursts will not be felt. Nothing will be funny and nothing will be sad. The rumble of the tsunami will not be heard. Nothing will be loved or laughed about. The ash and sulfur in the air will not be tasted. Nothing will be holy. Nothing will be true. The stench of corruption will not be smelled. Nothing will be mysterious or awesome. Nothing will be known until it is again. Nothing. I like to thank um, all of the, all of you, all of you participants for coming along tonight today. Um, and our readers, Mandy Haggis and Evelyn Pye, for, for sharing their work and their, um, their insights into the, pra the practice of writing STEM poetry about climate. Um, I definitely need to thank um, Helen Lynch, Anish and uh, Kirsty for um, hosting today, and Bruce and the guys in the, in the media team um, for um, making it work seamlessly, except here where I am, <laughs> uh, which I just glitched a wee bit there, um, and uh, to, and particularly to Louise and to, and to Leslie for um, the amazing translation and, and transcription work that they do. Um, I great respect to both in terms of being able to keep up with us and, and, and translate. Um, and to the funders and the um, other supporters, Explorathon, Scottish Writer Centre, particularly the Word Centre at the Aberde at University of Aberdeen um, and uh, the Creative, Creative Scotland for some of the funding. Uh, I hope that's been an, an interesting and uh, inspiring um, workshop and discussion today um, and look forward to hearing uh, from you and seeing you hopefully in real life next year um, when we can carry this conversation on somewhat. Thank you.